Hi everyone, welcome to this talk on building UX processes at Small to Mid Size Studios. Today we'll be talking about how you can start implementing UX processes based on our personal experiences at different companies with different pipelines and different types of UX roles. I'm Nida, I'm a user experience designer and user researcher at Netspeed Games, and we're currently building a mobile game that's um, a wholesome MMO. Um, and I'll introduce you to my two other panelists. Emma? Hi, I'm Emma Barrio. I work as the UX lead at Frozen Byte. Uh, I've been working there for a few years now, and it's my first games and UX job, which has been very exciting, and I've learned a lot. We're, we've just launched Trine last year, Trine 4, and we're working on Starbase, a sci-fi MMO currently that's going to be in early access early next year. Cool. Uh, my name is Kirk. I'm an advanced researcher at EA. I'm currently working with folks like Respawn, Dice LA, and Industrial Toys. Um, I am wearing my most recent game, um, uh, Jedi Fallen Order. Um, yeah, cool. Let's get started. Um, let's start with you, Kirk, actually, because you've worked at a variety of different studios. Um, can you let us know a bit more about like what have you been? What have been your different experiences of uh, raising awareness around UX in your company? Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, in games, UX is something that that ha is a relative newcomer um, in a lot of ways. Uh, game design, um, UI design, both of these have long traditions, but UX uh, is a relatively recent addition to, to the way many people think about games. Which means that, that you know, if you're coming in as a UX designer, people are going to ask you, what's the difference between you and a game designer or you and a UI designer? Uh, if you come in as a UX researcher, people are going to be like, so what, you do usability studies on the UI? Um, or they'll, they'll, they'll sort of instinctively try to push and pull you into whatever their idea is of what, what UX is, which is often wrong, right? Um, so that's the first thing I would keep an eye out for. Is, is understanding how people in the whatever company you're going to think of UX, what their idea is. And then as soon as you're humanly able to, uh, get, like come in and figure out ways to educate them about what is actually pertaining or not. Yeah, that sounds very familiar. Um, when I joined Frozen Byte, they didn't have any UX professionals. Uh, per se. They had a lot of designers and they and basically everyone else has a really good grasp on user experience intuitively and through the company culture, but they don't necessarily have the language or more specific tools on how to build it. So it's sometimes a bit scattered on how it's done. And for a long time, I was, everyone called me the UX designer, but they practically thought I was the one who handles all of the UI for all of the games, which was not true. But a lot of the conversations that I had were kind of like coffee table or offsite discussions on how does this affect, um, affect things and how is this effect seen? How is this animation done? Could it be weightier or whatever if, you're, if it's a jump or something? So it's very subtle at times and it's hard to explain maybe. Why do you think teams need a UX designer or UX person to come in and solve those problems for them, especially if their role does overlap with a lot of other in the day to day? Um, for my personal experience, it's just so much easier to have one person to take that lens and look through it. I've talked to some coworkers about personas, for example, and just play as a player instead of a designer or uh, an artist because they are so entrenched in their job or maybe if they're juniors what they want to become so they focus on one aspect of what they're doing or they want to be doing whereas we focus on what the player actually encounters and take a holistic view of everything what do you think kirk um yeah i think that like I do think, well, first off, I do think it's possible to make good games without UXD or UXR. That's a controversial um, thought, but, I, you know, they, 
plenty of games were made before UFC or UXR ever existed. Many great games. Um, and the I think the key point for uh, UXD or UXR professional joining a team is figuring out where where it is that you can add to that game that that wouldn't be good that wouldn't be as good if you were if you weren't there. Um, so especially early on, finding that that place to contribute, that place to have an impact, is uh, going to be very important. Um, like uh, I think. Uh, the, in our outline, we talk about this a little bit later, but I'm going to jump ahead. Um, like one of the one of the first things you could do as a solo UXer is look for the I wouldn't say easy wins, but like the uh, the 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 low hanging fruit of us that like that um, are really easy to establish that there are issues on um, and relatively easy to to research and or design a solution for. Um, an example that isn't games related, but, uh, but I mean, it kind of is, it's a dating site. So they're basically a game anyway. Um, the one example from it, from the dating site I worked at was where we, uh, um, nobody really knew who their, their player was. And we did a, uh, um, like there were lots of hypotheses, lots of like data analytics that, that, that tried to explain behavior, but there was no you know, clear idea of what the customer journey was and uh, and what and who the players were. Um, so the two, the two of the major um, initiatives that I pushed forward were to do like to figure out a, a player journey map, but not, not a user journey map. So we understood what the the journey was back at in and out in and out of the dating uh, uh, service. And then, of course, we uh, we did a, seg a data based se data informed segmentation uh, that led to personas that helped the team really understand who they were designing for and what their needs were, which is something that they they really hadn't done up to that point. And so, those were two those are examples of low hanging fruit. Yeah. Not, not easy, but like <laughs> obvious. Yeah, I've had a similar thing where I joined a team. And the first thing I pushed for was an actual written down project plan on what the core mechanics are, what is happening in the game. The team was very small and they communicated a lot and they all knew what was going on. But as I was joining in and I was the first one of a few people to join in toward the end of the production, this was something that needed to be done. And that was not something I anticipated to do. I don't think anyone really anticipates when they're a UX designer to start doing project management stuff, but it's sometimes something that needs to be done before you can do your job. So, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, like a big part of the job for me has been kind of somewhat project management in that sense of like, uh, you're in a really great place to have a holistic overview of the project because you're touching different teams and it's really nice to bring people together and ensure you have like a really clear vision about like what your game is or what it could be and especially around who your players are. Um, so when I joined a team, for example, one of the first projects I did was a persona project and I think it's because it's one of the most accessible ways um, that game designers and the teams understand their players. But for me, it was important to have some science and I'm putting in air quotes because everyone's definition of that varies um, as much as you can do on a tiny budget. Um, so this was conducting interviews with users and running, uh, running some surveys. And then when all the data came in, I segmented it into like general persona ideas. But then I ran a workshop with the team where we actually named the personas. Um, but we don't use actual actual people names. We use like names of like a key trait that that person has to avoid any biases. Um, but we came together and like came up with the final personas. And I think that's another key skill to have is like ensuring your team is always with you along the journey and they can see your process as well. Um, so they can see how you're adding value at all stages of development, not just after release when they bring in UX people to fix things. Um, you can start providing value way early on, I think. Nita, I think you brought up a really, really important point there, and I want to expand on it a little bit. Um, as a single UX practitioner, uh, frankly, there is no way that you're going to be able to do everything. And the way to survive in a situation like that was two things. One, of course, is ruthlessly prioritized, but the other 
is to recruit um, fellow travelers that exist in your company already. Um, and what does this mean? So if you're a researcher, you, you help you, um, with a team of designers, you help teach the designers how to do research more effectively, or you give them tools to self-serve. Um, if you're a designer, uh, well, I mean, I'll let Emma uh, speak to this one, speak to the, the, if you're a designer, but, um, but the, basically the idea is like, uh, when you're the only UX practitioner, the only UX researcher, the only UX designer, it, you have you, you can't be precious about like what is and isn't the job of the UX person. You got to take your help where you find it. Is basically what how I would say it. Yeah, I fully agree. It's also about getting buy-in from the team because yes. you could have done all the personas by yourself and presented it to the team and then say this is what you have to use from now on, and they would maybe maybe they would embrace it maybe they would look at it and think oh this is cool but not really use it but once you had them go through the data help like do the personas themselves um they it's something that they made instead of they're given something to use so they're more likely to understand them better and have more ownership of it which sometimes can be a bit difficult for the UX person, especially if you're alone and you're always facilitating and getting people to get to the conclusions by themselves, because you do a lot of hard work when you're facilitating, say, a workshop to create personas, and then the designers walk off and say, oh, I made these cool things, and now I use them in my work, and you can feel a bit overridden, but you can't be precious about that because it's about getting the job done, and I think most people will know that without you, it wouldn't have happened, and yeah, it's better to get the job done than to be a superstar if this is something that I did and it's super cool. Yeah, yeah especially with tools like personas, and that's the one I mentioned because it's the one you've used a lot, but it's also something that you iterate upon as well. So when like your game goes live, you've then got a lot of telemetry and segmentation data that you can use to kind of inform that a bit more accurate. Um, but just leading on from that, like what tools and methods do you uh, recommend or have used in your work, especially in a small studio where you're working really fast and how do you um, integrate a lot of that scientific method or being data informed into that process without slowing the team down or making them feel like they're making mistakes and things like that? I'll, I'll jump over with that. So yeah. um, the, the idea is that for, for me, um, when you're an early UX practitioner, your budget can be vanishingly small. Um, there was one one team that I worked with where my quarterly budget, and this was like ridiculous, was like three k to work with for recruiting. This was everything for recruiting, for for licenses, for everything, and um, so that was very constraining, but also led to a lot of creativity. Um, so, um, look for tools that are either open source or free, um, in terms of like actual UX tools that, that, that exist, um, or pick and choose strategically which tools you are, you actually, you absolutely need to have purchased. Um, like I'm sure there are some design tools that are, um, that are best with, that are not open source. But I, I think I remember there was at least some of the interaction design tools that some of my colleagues used that, that were open source at the time. Um, for like wireframes and things like that. So there's a surprising amount of stuff out there that's just free uh, with, a, with a specific kind of license. Um, in terms of methods, um, really the key is to be flexible. Um, like, so you may, like, whenever, this is a a, a follow-up to the the, the 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 method mantra, which is always choose the right method for the question, um, rather than than bring the bring the method with you to whatever question you might find. Um, but the but one of the things that um, in for a for a small studio is that you may not have as much flexibility. Like you may want to do this really kind of obscure approach for a research I'll just speak as a researcher you may have a you may know this research approach that like worked really well for you like maybe right right the right methodology is something that 
that you really like for the particular question that is being asked. Um, but it, everyone is like, wait, so you're telling me you have to take, take, the, take a product manager, a designer, an engineer, and you offline for a whole week to do, to do one study? Why would we ever, why would we do that? That throws our entire schedule out of line. Um, and like, when you actually do it, you can demonstrate that this, that a study like that can accelerate schedules by, by actually solving many problems. But like on paper, it's, it can be very difficult to do. So instead, you know, start small, start, what is the minimum that, what, what is the, the minimum viable product basically uh, that I can provide? that would uh, help people get used to the idea of this new approach rather than dunking them in all the way immediately. Yeah. Um, on a general level, it's really hard to add to that. <laughs> so I'll go through an example sort of what we've been doing at my company. Um, we do a fair amount of play tests, just like playthrough tests or as long as the players have time and they want to play um, toward the end of production. And before that, we haven't really had a research group to st uh, plan the studies or anything. So it's always been easier just to have, like once we have something to actually play and it looks nice enough that people are focusing on the game and not the way it looks, we do that. So a lot of what we do is that our designers or the team plays the game and does what can be called it, um, expert evaluation. I think there are tons of names for that, but basically, you know, you're an expert of something and you play through the game and then focus on those things. So artists usually comment a lot on artistic things, but they can also comment on um, design parts and everything as well that they find important. And what we've been doing and what I've especially been doing, I play through the game and then I point out things you know, players might have a problem with this. They might not see this. This might be a problem area. This might be too obvious. But use language that maybe we want to research this further. This is just an idea that I know based on my background, but this is not the truth. To kind of instill the idea that, you know, this is something that is good that we're doing, but we could be doing maybe more and getting players and being more mindful on how we're doing playtesting, which is an ongoing project to improve the playtesting that we do? I'm gonna to add to that. Um, the other thing that you can do is to help team pick up more of what you're doing is to find an executive sponsor. You know, find somebody at your company that really believes in what you're doing that is a senior person. Maybe, I, I, I you know, maybe the CEO worked uh, at, at a company that had a a uh, healthy UX culture previously or something like that and, and knows what they're missing. Or maybe the uh, the director of product management or maybe even the, 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 uh, the, the, you know, head of engineering, you know, like as long as it's somebody that has a lot of like heavy influence in the company, uh, anyone can be the, the UX champion. Um, and in fact, like you should encourage anyone who wants to be, whether they are powerful in the organization or not to be, be UX champions. Um, and like this, you know, in fact, like if you find yourself the sole UXer, you'll find that most of your time is spent not actually doing UX work, but it's actually selling UX work. You'll be, every interaction, you'll be like, like subtly trying to work in, um, like how important it is to do, to do a, do research or, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we were able to, um, spend the time to develop, uh, um, a, a framework before we, we started designing the system. Um, you know, like, and c like the, the constant selling is something that, that people who uh, come into established UX departments just don't realize that it's a, that's a thing. Yeah, and that can be very difficult because it's easy to go for the low hanging fruit and the easy wins, but if they're too small, it might mm -hmm. not, Go, progress very far but right. if you don't have the buy-in of leadership it is really hard to do the big pushes which can still be done but it's more difficult because there's more pushback yeah i agree like so something i've done at my studio is like when playtest data comes in i've got um 
our product management really cares product manager really cares about UX so we've got him on board and he'll go through the data with me and help me prioritize what's really important to feedback to the team and then we'll come up with like a quick exec summary that anyone can read in the wider team and then whilst that's been sent out and people are discussing that I'll then go through the data like much more deeply um, and come up with like recommendations or you know like a much more fuller report that people can refer to if they want to look at specific issues um, and it's been really nice because in one way the team gets the information they need and I also get the time to explore the problem space a little bit more and then from that like it results in different like tickets that we can put on the board or workshop ideas or internal discussions that we need to have um, and it's been really useful in that way like um, before I like joined the company and I was just learning about UX you learn about like a proper structure and process you have to go through in every UX job and then when you get the job you realize it's it is completely different that like you've got to tailor your methods based on what the team needs and what also you can offer as well. I think. Um, just on to the next question, because we've got quite a few left. Um, what do you think are some of the biggest hurdles you faced in your job and what do you think studios can do to support you better? So I know Emma, you spoke about buying a little. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah. Um we do have buy-in from our CEO. He is the most UX focused person and I think most knowledgeable on the subject within the company before I was there. Um, but he also is self-taught, so he doesn't understand and he doesn't have the methods necessarily. So it's sometimes difficult to say, do workshops with people because it takes all of the designers for a day or two to go over something and they could be designing the game. Um, we also have, uh, we've been streaming all the play tests. So anyone in the company can watch our players come and play the game. But if, uh, if we're very busy, they're discouraged from doing that because they have to keep working. And we usually do most tests towards the end of a production where we're most busy. So it's not always productive to do it that way. And kind of balancing those things is really hard. And in those instances, finding the buy-in and kind of getting a pipeline of how to do things more efficiently is important. And yeah, <laughs> I'm still struggling with that a little bit. So, um, sorry, I was sneezing. Can you remind me of the question? Uh, what are some common pitfalls you faced and how do you think like businesses can help UX people much better? Um, let's see. So I think that, that uh, what, what I what I see most often is the, I think um, Emma covered it uh, to some degree, but the, uh, the well-intentioned naive, uh, the person who um, maybe was exposed to UX uh, peripherally, um, thinks that they are, like they've been sort of doing it on the side. Um, and they're, maybe they, even, they, they were the, even the person that, uh, that pushed for, the, for your hire. Um, but then you come in and they're, 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 you realize, oh wait, this person is doing, I mean, you could argue about whether it's what, what, about wrong, what, whether they're wrong ways to do it, but doing it wrong and you have to gently educate them and and yeah like education is is a uh, um is uh, something that you'll be doing a lot of in a situation like that but but yeah like uh, te teach ha helping teams unlearn the bad habits they picked up in the absence of a ux professional i think mm -hmm. is yeah is a really big challenge so how do you ensure that like that um consistently occurs and doesn't go through like a decline? How do you keep the interest there? Um well the like I mentioned previously the always selling. Um <laughs> so there's that. Um but the uh it's not necessarily a a, a matter of interest as it is like patience and persistence and a continuing like continuous insistence on a specific kind of excellence and once people learn who you are like 
um, and that you're a collaborative person. You're not coming in there to tell them they're doing everything wrong. You're you're there to help them make their product better, more player focused. Once once people learn that and understand that about you, it, it gets a lot easier. Um, but but you just have to be aware that that occasionally you run into people that that are insecure um, or about like because they think they were, they already were doing it fine or that are you know think that they the way that they've been doing it for x number of years is is the right way to do it because but you know like by god it worked you know so so yeah yeah um one thing that often gets mentioned i think in situations like this is that you have to measure things that you have to show numbers and like things are improving and whatnot mm -hmm. but another big thing especially if you're alone is to give a mindset and like the mental model for the team to do a better job and that is very difficult to quantify or measure but if like say you are talking to the artists and you want to make sure that things are more colorblind friendly or accessible you can't just go over every screen that they make you have to give them the idea of like you know there are people who have color blindness and these are the colors that they can mix and these are the tools that you can test your things with but basically say if you want to have an experience point that is easy to see maybe have it have a border that's darker and then the inside is lighter so it stands out on every background these sort of things to for them to do the job really well without having to go through you every time. Yep. Frameworks and design principles um, can, can go a lot further than, uh, than trying to do just um, do it, do it, do the, the work every single time. So yeah, the, the old adage, teach them to fish. Um, so Although that's another question, like, what is the right amount of democratization of research? You know, that's another talk that we can do someday, but, uh, yeah. but not today. I mean, that does lead into our final question. Um, what tips do you have for studios looking to hire UX people? What things should they be looking out for or be consider of? I mean, I have strong opinions about this one, so I'll jump in first. Um, if, if you are not a UX person, uh, you are almost certainly not qualified to hire a UX person. Um, the and this is something that that very few people are going to are, are going to realize about themselves. So so you know like this may be inevitable, um, but like if if like if this is heard by a product manager or a CEO or somebody that is that's curious about UX um, and wants to do it, like the the advice I would give is find a agency or find a recruiting team that is experienced in hiring the type of skill set that you want to bring in and can help guide you in bringing in the right people um because you know that first ux hire is so so very important they will set the tone they will they will set the standards they will um like very likely like, not guaranteed but very likely they will end up leading whatever organization gets created. Um, and if you bring in the wrong person, you might might not end up with the kind of results you want to get. Yeah, and if you want to try things out, there are agencies that you can hire to run playtests or do something for you yeah. to see how these things can work before you commit to hiring someone. Because saying that, okay, we need a UX person to make everything better than hiring someone and then possibly not trusting them fully because they're a new hire um, is not a recipe for success. Yeah, just building on that, I think a really important thing to have is like clear boundaries around what the responsibilities are because that role is going to be so broad, uh, ensuring they have the, you know, the right resources and the right time dedicated to what's doing that. I think. Yeah, and just communicating those boundaries because I think I was seen as a UI person for the longest time. And that was fine because that was all I had time to do. And then like talk to other people about other UX things on the side and then build slowly my role to, you know, oh, she's doing prototypes of things <laughs> to, mm -hmm. oh, she's interested in research and kind of taking that a few steps forward. But setting boundaries so people don't burn out either. So it's like, this is something that you start with, you might grow it later, but 
this is what we're comfortable with and we don't expect more of you. Yeah, I agree. Taking care of your mental health is really important. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much both for your insights. Um, it's been a really useful chat and I hope those listening do have a lot of takeaways from this. Um, UX is great and you can have a lot of impact in a small studio. And yeah, please drop us any questions if you haven't. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.